let me welcome everyone to the Friday webinar. Uh, this is the last webinar of, of term, and it's also the second annual Elahe Omadiya Mir Jalali lecture. Um, and I'd like to thank particularly the Roshan Cultural Heritage Institute for assisting with the establishment of this annual lecture. Um, last year, we were very honored to have Professor Ervand Abrahamian as the first lecture in this series. And today, we are very pleased to welcome Professor Anush Ehtishami, who's going to talk about Iran and the Arab uprising, opportunity grasped or squandered. Um, Professor Ehtishami is, I'm sure, well known to everyone as he has had a long and distin distinguished academic career. His, his plaudits are, are too numerous to mention in detail, but just to give you a sense of things, Anush is Professor of International Relations in the School of Government and International Affairs, Durham University. He is the Nasr al Muhammad Sabah Chair in International Relations and Director of the Sheikh Nasr al Muhammad Sabah Program in International, in International Relations, Regional Politics and Security. He is Director of the Institute for Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies at Durham, and he acts as co-director of the AHRC-funded Open Worlds Initiative entitled Cross-Language Dynamics, Reshaping Community. He was Durham's, Durham University's first Dean of Internationalization, was the founding head of the School of Government and International Affairs. He has been a fellow of the World Economic Forum, and served as a member of the WEF's foremost body, the Global Agenda Council 2010 to 2012, focusing on energy. He was vice president and chair of the Council of the British Society for Middle Eastern Studies. He is editor of two major book series on the Middle East and is a member of the editorial board of seven international journals. He's published widely on the international relations of the Middle East and on the Islamic Republic of Iran. He has a very long record of publication, 90 articles in journals and many books. His most recent book is How China is Changing the Middle East, and in 2017, Iran Stuck in Transition. Um, I think this is an extremely uh, timely that he's going to give to us. It's a subject which is often the subject of much misunderstanding, both uh, scholarly misunderstanding and also misunderstanding in the wider media. And I'm extremely pleased to pass the lecture over to him, Professor Tishami. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stephanie, for your kind words. And can I thank you, uh, Professor Rogan, uh, the Middle East Center, and of course, St. Anthony's College, for giving me the honor of delivering this year's uh, annual lecture. Uh, but I have to say, uh, you've set the bar so high with Professor Rabbi Haman starting the series back in 2019, uh, that I can only disappoint, or at least set the bar lower for the mere mortals who will follow uh, Ervant in, in future. Um, this, as you say, is a vexed subject of inquiry. And some might say, 10 years on, uh, go get a life. The Arab uprisings have moved on. I would like to make the case that actually they haven't. Um, and we will, we will ignore them at our peril. And let me just, set my argument out on that front before moving forward to a more detailed discussion and commentary on, on Iran itself. So the uprisings, their causes, uh, as well as the consequences uh, are still an ongoing concern. The region's economic conditions um, have hardly improved. Poverty, unemployment, particularly youth unemployment, wealth disparity, lack of opportunity, environmental vandalism are all continuing to haunt the vast majority of people of the region. And all of these problems have, have magnified as a consequence of the pandemic. The pandemic has not only crushed national economies, but the countries have been compounded, the crisis have been compounded by soft oil prices. And I would argue it will take another decade or more for them to get back to where they were before the uprising started back in 2010. So we are looking at a very green prospect for the region. And the uprisings as they were, have not gone away. We have Sudan, Algeria, Iraq, Lebanon, just in recent uh, memory, igniting in protest uh, as well. 
And also the only lesson that the regional states seems to have learned from the uprisings is to become more masculine, to become more assertive and to become more resilient, uh, to become the fierce states that the late Nazi Ayubi had set out in his seminal work on the Arab state. If anything, they are more fierce today than they were at the outset of the Arab risings. What all this means, therefore, is that the causes of the uprisings remain unresolved and the call for change unanswered. In practice, that means that there is pent up anger and frustration right across the region. And if you scratch, that frustration is barely under the skin. It is only skin deep. So the region is still set for major upheaval going forward. My second general point relates to the conditions uh, of the region. I see the MENA region as an exposed and fragmented subsystem of the international system. But unlike others, it is penetrated by both outside powers and also irresponsible non-state actors who run riot across the region. Here, what happens in one country can and indeed does affect the well-being of the other countries. This reality, of course, is underpinned by some theoretical arguments which relates to notions of a regional security complex that Barry Buzan and Ali Weaver developed way back in 2003. But the crucial point to take away from their, their, their seminal work is that actually that they're all part of a major international system enmeshed in a global web of security independencies. But crucially, as the, and I'm quoting them here, and as most political and militarily threats travel more easily over short distances, insecurity is often associated with proximity. It is that proximity that I'll return to at the end of my lecture. Let's now turn to the other subject, and that is what I've put in my abstract, that, that Iran was arguably the most affected consequentially uh, by the uprisings. Some may find that unusual, uh, uh, but let me just put my case here briefly. I would say, as I've just argued, I've just stated rather, that no country stood to gain more from the Arab uprisings uh, in the region than Iran. It would help Iran end its regional isolation. It will give it a stronger foothold in the Arab region, which currently is, is focused around Syria and, and Hezbollah. It would help Iran flip US allies and build a cross section of Sunni Shia community of states, but more importantly for them, of peoples for the first time since the revolution. Indeed, I would argue for the first time in centuries, Iran would be looking at creating this coalition of Sunni Arab peoples and states. It will weaken Iran's enemy, Israel. It would shift the spotlight away from Iran's own domestic problems, particularly the Green Movement, of which I will speak more. And also, in a weakened community of Arab states, it would help Iran consolidate its resistance front, uh, which had been, been investing in since 1982. These are the general uh, uh, thesis why Iran was the most affected by the uprisings. But also there is broader context uh, to what I'm saying, and the context really matters in my view. Um, and it is all also about the way in which crucial events begin to impact behavior. And, and I'm going to highlight this point by looking at particular dates uh, to, to, to show the importance of systems, processes, consequences, uh, that context provides. Each of these dates is a critical turning point. And I will start with 9-11. 9-11 was where the region was essentially turned upside down and the US became much more of an intrusive power uh, in this region. It was followed in 2002, barely, barely a year later, by the infamous State of the Union address of President Bush, which further affected uh, thinking in Iran and elsewhere. Then 2003, where Iraq was invaded, which, which has had 
deep, deep, deep rooted consequences for the region, still uh, affecting uh, relations. 2005, which one would argue was the, the, the arrival of Iran's own neoconservatives. And I would say in a very direct response to what was happening in the broader region and the way that was affecting Iran's domestic constituency. For Iran in particular, the 2006, 2006 uh, summer of 2006, in which uh, Hezbollah declared war on Israel and arguably won it for the first time. And finally, 2009, where the Islamic Republic's legitimacy was questioned by millions of people on the streets for the first time since 1979. These are not random dates. These are all part and parcel of a process of securitization of the region. So by, nine, by 2010, I would argue, we were witness to a deepening of securitization in the region in which all manner of, of, of uh, life, whether policies, whether attributes, whether cultural practices and habits, whether traditional uh, behaviors of Iran and other Muslim majority countries were being scrutinized through the lens of security. From textbooks to the foreign policy was being subjected to a critical analysis of are these guys breeding terrorists uh, to come and blow up American buildings and, and innocent Europeans um, on holiday in Indonesia and elsewhere. This was a highly charged region by 2010. What this resulted in, of course, was, and here underlining the importance of secularization is both in narrative and in policy. So in this period before 2010, we became familiar with such phrases as, all those who are not with us are against us, or that some countries, including Iran, constitute an axis of evil, or that this is a war on terror, or that if Iraq doesn't behave itself, or if its leader Saddam Hussein doesn't comply, it will be subjected to America's shock and awe. These are all highly emotive, securitized statements that leave an impression on the minds of leaders and peoples of, of the region. But also they had very direct policy consequences. Afghanistan was invaded in the autumn of, of 2001, followed by Iraq, in, in, in March of 2003, Iran, Saudi Arabia, North Korea, Cuba, all these so-called adversaries were subjected to this direct sense of threat uh, arising from what was essentially America's new national security uh, doctrine. This background is important for understanding where the 2010-2011 the, the, the uprisings actually fit in the broader context of, of the region. Now, let me get to Iran and the uprisings themselves. The uprising started when Iran was grappling with three fundamental developments, some of which I've already alluded to, but let me develop these a bit further, if I may, uh, Stephanie. The first is what I've called the Islamic Republic's 1969 movement, moment. This was arguably when the Pahlavi monarchy began to realize the growing wealth coming from its oil exports and understood the importance of developing a grand strategy. And that was based on the notion of building your domestic power and constituency in order to be able to extend and project power in a more permissive regional environment. The Islamic Republic did not have this 1969 movement, moment until a short window between 2004 and 2006. 2004 is when Iran is confident of what we may call the Shianization of Iraq. That for over a century, finally, Iran's brethren, if you like, were in control of Iraq. For all the machinations of the British and the Arab forces, Iran was now able to talk Iraqi lead, leaders directly uh, with them, and many of, of whose current elite actually came from Iran, having been exiled by Saddam Hussein. That 2004 was Iran's window, strategic window onto Iraq as not just an adversary, but a close brother and friendly country. And the other 2006, which was 
where Iran could claim that its nurtured Hezbollah organization, having been armed, trained, and indoctrinated by jihad, had for the first time taken on the Israeli armed forces on the battlefield, and for the first time, in their view, had beaten the Zionist enemy in battle. That this was Iran's glorious moment. Very important to keep that in mind. Iran's leaders began to dream of a greater Iran, whose soft and hard power could now be stretched from the subcontinent to the east and to the Mediterranean in the west. What some called it the Shia Crescent was actually much bigger geopolitically and geostrategically. Secondly, Iran was at the same time facing the serious challenges of self-identity, of legitimacy, but also in practice, stability and acquiescence uh, posed by the 2009 Green Movement. The slogan, where is my vote, was a multifaceted, multidimensional attack on the legitimacy of the Republic. And that is really important, where from within the system, by some of its own elite members, question was raised about the authenticity of elections and the legitimacy of power in the Republic. Iran was grappling with this a year before the uprisings actually uh, broke out. And the third and equally important uh, problem for Iran was the growing impact of the Obama administration's uh, sanctions on Iran, in which not just a GDP, but the middle class was being squeezed and Iran's ability to continue to provide for the downtrodden was becoming increasingly difficult. Iran's inability to trade globally, to attract support globally, was being essentially questioned by uh, this increasing, what President Obama called the world's most intrusive uh, sanctions on any one country. These three forces were in the background uh, when the uprisings happened. And it was in this context that the uprisings seemed to Tehran to be offering a godsend, a golden geopolitical opportunity, which would knock out America's Arab allies, make the region, uh, uh, make the same countries more vulnerable, create space for Iran to spread its wings, to return to its 1969 movement, and to actually begin to exercise what he always saw as his legitimate revolutionary right amongst uh, the Muslim, Muslim lands. Indeed, it was Atala uh, Khamenei himself who said that events taking place in Tunisia and Egypt were, to quote him, a natural continuation of the Iranian revolution of 1979, an Islamic awakening, a phrase that stuck in the throat a little bit later. But I would also argue that Iran had no choice but to present the uprisings as Islamic awakening. Had it not done so, it would have had to submit to the fact that there are other revolutionary forces in play beyond Islam and beyond an Islam which is beyond its control. So in a sense, Iran was imprisoned by its own logic of revolution and, and narrative. In Iran's net assessment, the uprisings would decisively change the regional balance of power in the Islamic Republic's favor, assuring it of a greater influence, of greater protection for itself, and a much wider network of regional friends and like-minded Arab ruling regimes and elites that it had never had. But things did not turn out as Iran had expected or indeed assumed. And I'm going to illustrate this point by way of a number of examples. The first one, exhibit number one, Egypt. Egypt was the prize for everybody. Egypt, after all, is the beating heart of the Arab world. A close US ally, the first country to sign a peace treaty with Israel, the guardian of the Camp David Accords. Uh, Mubarak, a staunch anti-Islamist uh, president, who had mobilized Egyptian and other forces against political Islam across the region. An Islamic revolution in Egypt uh, would be a cultural, political, ideological earthquake. But Egyptians found Tehran's uh, utterances, utterances totally patronizing. As I heard my Egyptian friends and colleagues saying, 
we're not trying to get rid of Mubarak to end up with a Khamenei uh, in his place. Uh, we are not fighting Iran's ghosts and battles. We've got our own future to make. And that was something that was hard for Iranians to accept, partly because they have not had close proximity to the region. Isolation has actually hurt them and also hurt their neighbors. Sure, Muslim Brotherhood President Mohammed Morsi was a good thing. But when he was in power, he did not change course. Camp David stayed intact. Relations with Israel remained. America remained its, its, its ally. And it drew closer to Saudi Arabia than it would, we would have expected from any so-called Islamist leader. Morsi in power went further and opposed Iran's resistance front, its own axis of resistance. And there are three short examples to illustrate this. First is August 2012, soon after he was elected president, in Tehran's non-aligned movement meeting, um, significant first time a British president had been to Iran. He's given the red carpet treatment, welcomed as a friendly head of state, as indeed he was, and when he gets on platform, what does he talk about? It's essential that Saddam, that Assad is removed from power, that Egypt, its people, and the Arab world demand that Assad is removed from power. It doesn't matter what he said, it matters where he said it, in Tehran's corridors of power, where Iran was already the patron of the Assad regime. The second example, February 2013, when for the first time since the revolution, an Iranian president visits uh, Egypt. This was uh, President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, who arrived in Egypt in February 2013. He was greeted with red carpet and a guard of honor, as he should, uh, and he was thrilled to be in Egypt, the country about which he, he knew very little. When he met, however, with uh, the Muftis, the Islamist uh, leaders of Egypt and other political figures, they talked about sectarianism. They talked about Iran fanning the flames of sectarianism, of being anti-Sunni, of doing things in Syria that no Muslim would do. And these were hard pills for the president of the Islamic Republic uh, to accept. And the third example, of course, was the resistance front in which Iran had invested so heavily since the 1980s, had one Sunni participant, and that was Hamas. Hamas from 1988 uh, onwards, uh, as it lost uh, its voice and support from the rest of the Arab world, began to lean on Iran and Iran found in Hamas a, a, a useful revolutionary anti-Zionist Palestinian organization. And unquestionably Hamas's inclusion in the resistance front was an important coup for Iran. But come change of regime in Egypt, the first thing that happens is uh, uh, Hamas reconnects with Egypt. The second, the second thing that happens is uh, Mash'al, its leader who was based in Damascus, in protest to Iran's role in suppressing the uprisings, moves out of uh, 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 Syria and is given home in Qatar and open arms in Egypt. This was a blow for Iran. This revolution, Islamic awakening in Egypt was not of the sort that Iran could make many friend, friendly deals with. The second example, I'll move on quickly, was the Arab monarchies. This was after an opportunity for Iran to push against the monarchies, particularly uh, in the Gulf, Gulf, Gulf Arab monarchies. Here though, money and force restored order and compliance. And the only place where there was a whiff of a revolution and that was in Bahrain, Iran had no choice but to sit on its hands while a Saudi-led GCC force moved in, demolished the symbols of revolution in Bahrain and ensured that Al-Khalifa regime stays in power. Iran's revolutionary ideas could travel but not its influence beyond its borders. In, the Yibi, in Libya and Yemen, I Iran had a slightly different uh, take. Libya was too far for it to do much about, but Gaddafi was a, a residual supporter of Iran in the past, gone. Yemen, however, was where Iran could claim 
geostrategic gains. It, of course, could support the Houthis, who's still there, who's still poking a finger in the eye of Saudi Arabia. And that, geostrategically speaking, is a good thing as far as Iran is concerned. But that has come, I would argue, against much loss of diplomatic and political clout in the wider region, and also greater animosity from Riyadh as well. But it is exhibit number four, Syria, where everything begins to uh, unravel. Here is where the Islamic, Re Islamic Republic's Islamic awakening turns into an absolute nightmare. Iran changes its narrative very quickly, no longer talking of Islamic awakening, but now referring to Syria's Sunni uh, uprising, that's what it was initially, as terrorists threatening the stability of a legitimate government and a critical member of the resistance front. The Takfiris were on the march, supported by the great Satan and the Wahhabis to undermine the resistance uh, in Syria. And that Iran needed to act to protect what was a revolutionary agenda for the wider region. Its rush to provide military, logistical, and financial support invited further derision and exposure uh, in the wider region, who are now sensitive to revolutionary change right across the Arab world. In, and this exposed Iran even further to the Salafi jihadi call of attacking this Shia menace that is undermining Sunni uh, struggles. Having to buttress a weakening ally uh, was one thing, but having to play second fiddle to Russia, who really saved uh, Assad's chair, uh, seat of power, was something else. Iran had shown the limitations of its ability to project power uh, in this moment of crisis. Also, having to mobilize Shia militias, Hezbollah, militias from Iraq, from Afghanistan, from Pakistan, uh, and so on, was also a, a, a problem. And that merely added to this tenor of Iran is waging a sectarian war in Syria, making it even stronger and legitimizing countries like Saudi Arabia and others to mobilize against, against Iran. Iran's, whether you call it miscalculation, misreading, uh, certainly his intervention proved costly in man and treasure. We don't know the exact figures, but Iran may have, may have devoted as much as $10 billion, money that he didn't really have to spend in keeping Assad afloat. It has lost hundreds of its own people and thousands of the militias immobilized from elsewhere to keep Assad in power. But it also had cost it in reputation. The call of the neo Safavis coming forth was one that did not sit comfortably with Iran's revolutionaries. Being called sectarian was not something that they had fathomed. But most importantly of all, being called occupier of Arab lands, a title reserved only for Israel, was something that really, really affected Iran's personality and self-belief uh, in his mission. All of this meant that Iran was the inevitable target of Salafi jihadis. What does all this mean? First, that there has been domestic blowback from Iran's hubris during their uprisings. We've seen in 2017 and 2018, mass mobilization against corruption, poverty, lack of opportunity, lack of democracy, and so on. And the slogans link Iran's behavior in the region directly to the regime's legitimacy. When they say, not Syria, not Lebanon, not Gaza, but we'll die for Iran, is a very clear statement of discontent from vast population mobilized. But also Iran's intervention in the region has in many ways hardened the factional arteries in Iran, and it has arguably strengthened the rise of a conservative alliance, which is now in control of the parliament and will be in control of, of the presidency come June 2021 elections, that, that has cleared the middle ground, the space for dialogue 
within Iran itself. Iran's regional alliances remain weak and fragile, but most importantly, they're all high maintenance. To keep its foot in Iraq, to keep control in Syria, to keep Hezbollah afloat, to keep the Houthis as a thorn in the side of the Saudis come with a heavy price tag. And Iran is having to pay it out of its own pocket and no one else's. And also the uprisings are a group of sharpened confrontation between Iran and Israel and have further securitized Iran's relations with virtually all of its Arab neighbors, but bar Iraq uh, and, and, and Syria. Um, fear and perceived threat of rivalry uh, and Iran's growing regional role, in my view, was the precursor to the Abraham Accords, which have now changed the geopolitical dynamic so much that Iran is now an increasingly isolated country standing uh, against Israel in ways that was not the case before the 2010s. So finally, were opportunities squandered? Yes. Could things have been different? My argument is probably not, given the context and, and, the, and the arguments that I've made. But does the future look better or more promising? I would say, alas, not. So long as Iran and also other regional countries continue to assume that they are playing into a zero-sum game rather than a shared geopolitical game in which cooperation can yield better outcomes than competition, we're gonna go around the same circle again when the Arab masses decide to rise again for their rights. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, Anush. That was extremely um, textured analysis of the history of the past 10 or 15 years. Um, I'd just like to ask you a couple of questions before we move to the wider audience. And the first question really, picks up where, where your, your final words ended. Um, and you mentioned at the beginning of your talk, the gains that were available to Iran as a result of the Arab uprising. And these were considerable. Um, and I wonder then, of course, the Americans and the Israelis would have been equally aware of these gains that the Arab uprisings were opening up for Iran. So I wonder to what extent you think that the very magnitude of the opportunity offered to Iran dominated the politics of the region in subsequent years. In other words, the stakes were so high that the intervention, sometimes covert, sometimes overt, of the Americans and the Israelis was aimed primarily at limiting Iran's um, expansion uh, and as a consequence, encouraged the darkest forces in the region to uh, greater stability. So we have, again, uh, and, and you mentioned some of these, um, really very, very difficult situations in the countries where the Arab Spring was, was most uh, marked. So, and, and you said at the end, could things have been different? Probably not. And I'm just wondering if you could expand on that a little bit and say what you think Iran might have done to mitigate the, the difficulties that it faced, not just in its regional relations, but in the, 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 the respect of aggravating its, its tensions with, with the US and Israel. The other question really is a similar sort of thing, but you, you, you explained how, for example, the Iranians radically misread the situation in Egypt. And I'm just wondering, I mean, you said it's because of their isolation, but it seems to be more than that, in the sense that it was very obvious, I think, to, to, to observers that Morsi was not a Khomeini. The Muslim Brothers are not revolutionaries. They are conservative. They were likely to form alliances with other conservative forces. So it isn't difficult to understand that. And I'm just wondering if you think, the fact that the Iranians got that so spectacularly wrong is a kind of code for a much wider misunderstanding about what's going on in these individual countries. Uh, very insightful question, Stephanie. Thank you. I think you're absolutely spot on. Let me take the second one first. It's true that, that actually Iran has as much clue about what's going on in Egypt 
as Obama did in the White House. Um, for all for all of of talk of Islamic solidarity and so on, Iran's Islamic revolution has been a highly isolating experience. And the less contact Iran has had with its wider regions, the more isolated it has been and the less it actually understands what makes these other countries tick. And the absence of diplomatic relations, but also any cultural contact, inevitably Iran would fall in the same misunderstanding of when masses in Tahrir Square mobilize and some shout Allah Akbar, so that's the same Allah Akbar that they hear in, in the, in the Jomah prayers in Tehran. It was not, it was not. And the fact that they, they reduced, and, and I'm not using this, this term, um, you know, this is rightfully, but the fact that they reduced what was going on in the wider region to an Islamic awakening uh, was completely misreading what the Arab youth in particular the same constituency that is, is resisting Tehran's uh, normative position, were asking for. All they had to do was tune in to Al Jazeera, interpret the slogans in Tahrir Square to understand this was no Islamic revolution. Uh, and, and they did misread it. And so when Morsi goes to Tehran, they are completely taken aback by his position that we, the Arabs, stand in support of the Syrian revolution. Inevitably, he would say that. Of course he would. Um, and, and that when Ahmadinejad goes to Cairo and he goes to Al-Azhar, what they will tell him for the first time meeting an Iranian president is keep your nose out of Arab affairs. Uh, of course they would say that, inevitably. But it goes further than that, Stephanie. When Qaradawi in, in, in Doha, meeting at, at a high level meeting uh, of Arab, Arab dignitaries that is looking to bolster the position of the Syrian national forces, refers in his speech to Hezbollah Shaitan when talking about Hezbollah, yeah, is a very clear message that Iran's narrative is unwelcome apart from all of its behavior. So yeah, absolutely, they misread it. Um, and, and, and in some ways, they only shed crocodile tears when Morsi was deposed. Um, first question, equally interesting, uh, whether things could have been different. I would argue that that was less of Iran's own making, but rather a victim of this, the broader environment in which the uprisings took place, where the region was already highly charged. Um, and, 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 and the fact that the US had intervened in Iraq without consent and support of Arab, Arab regimes, Arab states, uh, was a significant blow. Um, going to regional capitals, one was struck by the animosity that you felt by elites against the United States. It's not that they loved Saddam Hussein. They complained for three reasons. One was you can't just march into Arab states and remove people you don't like. You have exposed us to our proximity to you by our people. And thirdly, you have opened the gates, as the Saudis said, of Iraq to, to Iranians marching in and taking over one of the most important Arab countries on the planet. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, and, 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 and it's true, these were important uh, developments. And so having, having occurred in a highly securitized, polarized environment in which not only Iran at home had problems, but the region more broadly had problems, including outside intervention, there was, I don't think, much room beyond a zero-sum game calculation. Um, and I would say, sadly, that in a sense, look at Myanmar today. What do you see the regional countries do to address that problem? They are also caught in their own bubble of insecurity. 
uh, rather than converging together, they all find shelter in their own comfortable habitats. And that was what was happening in the region in 2010. I hope that captures your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anush. And perhaps I'll now hand over to Professor Rogan, who I think has been keeping an eye on the questions from the Thank audience. Thank you, Stephanie. Yes, the questions are already starting to come in fast and furiously. Let me remind all viewers that if you would like to put a question, please just go to the Q&A bar at the bottom of your screen and type your answer and we'll take all the questions we can fit. If you would like your name to be associated with your question, type your name. But if you'd rather be anonymous, we take anonymous questions as well. Now, I'm going to begin with a question from Yasmin Mather, who takes you back to uh, Syria, Anush and asks whether we couldn't also envisage a situation where Saudi intervention was deliberately planned to draw Iran into the civil war. And what's your response to Iran's claims that had it not fought for Damascus, it would have faced a war in Tehran? I, 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 Iran had made it very clear uh, when, when fires were burnt in Rabah that, that it, would, it would have to defend uh, Assad. Uh, uh, I don't know how many had made it very clear before that. In fact, uh, he said in, 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 in a celebrated uh, speech that if we don't fight them in Syria, we'll have to fight them in Kermanshah. Um, uh, in many ways, ironically, this is Israel's uh, security doctrine. Fight your battles away from your borders. One lesson at least Iranians have learned from Israel. Um, Saudis, of course, capitalize on this because it was the first time that they could strike at the heart of the axis of resistance and flipping Syria in the ways that Iran had perceived Egypt flipping was strategically important for Saudi Arabia because before 2010, Saudis had invested heavily in making a friend of Assad. Um, and, and, and they would rather now move on to a Sunni majority regime in Syria which was also unheard of going back to the 1950s, if not before. And that would have been a historic opportunity for them to do to Iran what they saw Iran did to them in Iraq. So there is all this machination uh, going on. And in a sense, inevitably, uh, Iran intervened, Saudi would have intervened as well. Uh, second question, Eugene, was? Coming up now, the second question comes from Mehdi Oskari who wants to draw that parallel between the Arab uprisings in 2011 and Iran's green movement of 2009. To what extent do you think Iran influenced the outbreak of the Arab Spring uprising? Uh, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't set out a stall arguing that the green movement was a catalyst for the uprisings because, you know, looking at Egypt, Egypt had had and we will have in future a cycle of protest and violence uh, against the protesters for from bread to voting, to housing, to land distribution, to public transport, to price of taxi fares, you name it. Uh, Lebanon in 2005 had been up in arms uh, for the Hariri uh, assassination. Um, Iraq had had its own mass movements at that time as well. So the Green Movement was not something that triggered in faraway Tunisia, but what it was, was a sense of solidarity that they felt with Iranian people. Uh, beyond that, it was much more of a concern for the regime that, oh goodness, now we are really vulnerable because the Arab masses, the Arab youth, are marching in the way that our people did in many millions uh, in 2009. Well, let's stay with the theme of Iranian society here. And Irfan begins asking how you've spoken a lot about the Iranian state's response to the Arab uprisings, but could you comment on Iranian society's responses to the Arab uprisings or the view of Iranian society? Has there been much divergence between state and society on the subject? What an excellent question, Eugene. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, there, there has been. Um, in, in, the, in the early days when Iran intervened in Syria, 
there was a degree of tolerance because it was an arm's length. Iran did not have troops on the ground. Body bags were not coming back to Iran. Iran was not celebrating the role of its generals in Syria. Iranians were not watching militias walking across into Syria. Uh, uh, Fatim Yun were not being celebrated uh, as brigades in Syria. And also the treasury was not being squandered in Syria. It's when those realities began to strike. And for all of Iran's isolation, its population remains highly networked. The regime has failed miserably to distance Iranian population society from international networks. And the news gets to them. They may not be allowed to have satellite television legally, but they have it illegally. In fact, they buy it from supplies of the regime uh, themselves to make sure that it's not then taken off of them. So they became aware of the cost of the Syrian war and also the security dimensions of the Syrian war. And as such, did begin to articulate a much, much harsher position on the regime support for Syria. Um, but you only see flashes of this in street protests and slogans that we hear from time to time in Iranian towns and cities. Formally, Iran is there to protect Syria as the linchpin of axis of resistance, which is the ultimate liberator of all Muslims. Informally, it's very conscious of the cost of having to carry what Americans call lemon states, and the cost of that for its own grip at home, particularly on the sanctions. So, you know, the phrase chickens come to roost really did so post uh, Syrian civil war. Thank you, Anoush. Our next question call comes from Paul Ertz, who's joining us from the University of Amsterdam. He says that your talk reminds him of Kissinger's famous saying that is Iran a cause or a nation? That is to say, there is no mention at all of Iran's own security considerations, usually addressed by the notion of forward defense. Is this notion completely nonsensical? And is Iran of the 21st century still the same as the revolutionary Iran under Ayatollah Khomeini? So kindly elaborate on that one. Yeah. Uh, uh, did you say Paul Art? I did. Yeah, he is a troublemaker, Eugene. I told you not to let him in. You know, he got right past me and he's on his way to you now, Anoush. It's, it's, it's wonderful to have a question from Paul and, it, and it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a very insightful comment, if I may say so. Um, I, I, I think, I think you know, let's get constructivist for a moment. And I think Iran is a state uh, and an idea. Uh, rather, let me correct that. The Islamic Republic is a state and an idea. Uh, and its elite chooses which is more convenient in his arsenal. At times, it's an, it's an idea, the Islamic awakening notion. And at other, more times, I would add, it is a state that what Iran does, it does in the interest of the Islamic Republic of Iran itself. It is very clear on that. In that sense, it behaves like any other state and it uses all sorts of justifications all manner of justifications for its misconduct as well as its conduct. It does have legitimate interests. Having invested in the partnership with Syria since 1979, it will not let it go without a fight. Having kept Hezbollah in place since 1982 and have it seen in action as this very effective, very effective uh, revolutionary militant armed force in Lebanon, in Syria, but also against Israel, it is part of its forward defense. Absolutely no question about it. It will keep it there as long as it can. And Syria helps keeping it uh, there. Iraq being a Shiite state helps Iran keeping Iraq and Syria as part of its broader strategic uh, arena. It does give it forward defense. And it can justify just about this within this notion of axis of resistance. But towards the end, I alluded to the reality that actually the ground is shifting 
on the defeat of the Islamic Republic. The fact that Bahrain, UAE, Morocco, Sudan, Sudan that Iran had so invested in, in the 80s and 90s, has now got relations with Israel, no matter under what conditions is not the question here, shows that Iran's ability, not just not question of control, but to even set agendas are slipping away from it. And that would be a cause of concern if I was sitting where Atala Khamenei is sitting in Tehran. Well, you're beginning to attract many old friends and uh, usual suspects, but I have the next question from Professor Matteo Legrenzi, who's joining us from Venice, who wants to know with the likely renewal of the JCPOA and the situation in Yemen being what it is, aren't things starting to look bleak for the Saudi grand strategy? Do you think the current Iranian government will be able to rise to the occasion and exploit the space between the Biden administration and the Saudi government? Ciao, Matteo. It's lovely to see you. Or rather, rather lovely to have your, your question. Uh, another good one, Eugene. This, this is the problem with your, with your crowd. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I, I, I think both Iran and Saudi Arabia want the Yemen question settled. Uh, I, think, I think the Houthis are now more trouble uh, than they're worth for Iran. And they've been trouble for Saudis from the beginning. But we need, we need an honest broker here. I would like to see Oman involved, for example, uh, to try and de-escalate. Uh, they've done so before. I would very much welcome their role. I would like the, the, the Kuwaiti uh, government to intervene in this. What we don't want is America to intervene in this, given what, what was in, uh, underlined, underlining your question, Matteo, is the tension, what we perceive as tension in the Biden-Saudi uh, relations. I think that will probably blow over in any case, given that they've got bigger fish to fry uh, or that they'll come to some modus operandi. Uh, but we need a regional honest broker to help us through this. Qatar is being very active on, on, on these fronts uh, as well. But the fact that Qatar meets with, with uh, others to find a negotiated settlement to Syria will not sit very, very kindly with the Iranians. Uh, so there is question mark over that one. But I, I, I think what this requires to cut a long, long, long answer short is for the parties to recognize that it's time for them to come to the table and find a solution, not in their own interest, but in the interest of Yemeni people. It is a stain on the whole Muslim world to have so many innocent Yemenis dying of hunger in the 21st century. This is staying on all of us, but for Muslims in particular, who talk about brotherly love for each other, not to rush to the aid of Yemeni people, not to force Iran and Saudi Arabia to end this nonsense is of importance here, not what the United States does. Anusha, it wouldn't be 2021 if I didn't have a couple of questions for you on the pandemic. So let me put these two questions to you in quick succession and you could take the both of them together. The first comes to you from our student, David Roddy, who asks, do you think that the state society connection has been weakened by government failures during the pandemic? And does that put Iran at an increased risk of uprising today than was the case in 2011? So now hold on to that one. Okay. Then our second question, which is gonna look specifically at China's role or influence as a result. This comes from Andreas Burkhardt, who asks, you mentioned the effects of the pandemic on the region and growing interdependencies. With this in mind, how do you see China's influence in Iran developing post-COVID and the impact of this influence on reform movements in the country? Uh, thanks, Eugene. I would like to issue myself an invitation to come back to talk at length uh, on Andreas's question about China. Um, but not to disappoint, I will, I will talk about that. Let me take the first one first, which was on state society relations post-COVID. There, there has been a complete breakdown of trust uh, between state and society over COVID, not just because of the Iranian government's incompetence in managing the pandemic in Iran, but also because of what is seen as Iran's indulgence of the pandemic at its very beginning, where they failed to alert the population 
when they were going to vote in the parliamentary elections and they failed to alert the population when they were organizing the celebrations for anniversary of the revolution where people in their hundreds of thousands are encouraged to come out. Weeks later, we see this spike in infections. And while the rest of the world is beginning to distance itself in terms of geographical access to China, we have Mahan flights continuing between Iran and China. Uh, and Iranian officials come back on a daily basis from China, on a daily basis from China, when this is declared a pandemic. And what's more so, because it's the elite traveling, they take the virus in the back pockets and go to places like Qom and spread it amongst the clergy. And one of the reasons why the death rate spiked in Iran was because many of these elderly people had absolutely no defense against COVID and it spread like, fire, like wildfire in Iran. So Iranian population society is anxious about the state's ability to, to address the rise of the, of the pandemic, but also it's the ability to this day of having a strategy for vaccination, for example. Whose vaccine do Iranians take? Whose vaccine do they trust? What happened to the 200,000 vaccines that came in from the West? when Iran said it was not gonna take any vaccine from the West. These are all kind of, you know, now existential questions for society. So you're right, strains in state society relations have in many ways deepened uh, rather than, 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 than being shortened as a consequence of, of the regime's response. And, and question, Andres's question on China, part of that I've already uh, mentioned uh, unquestionably, so long as sanctions on the, are in place, Iran's relations with China will not just endure, but will develop. There are this 25 year old strategic partnership of many billions of dollars of investment in Iran is important to Iran. Iran is important to China for strategic reasons, for energy reasons, for ge geopolitical reasons, for Belt and Road Initiative reasons and also for the fact that Iran of all of its neighbors stands aside from the United States in a global game where tensions between Beijing and Washington seem to be rising. Thank you so much, Anush. We're coming to the end of our time for questions and I already owe our audience a huge apology because I can see another 12 questions piling in. So inspiring has your talk been. And I've also been, economical with the questions because each and every one begins by praising you, Anush, and saying how much they've enjoyed the talk and send you greetings. But in the interest Thank of keeping the questions short and sharp, let me end with one more that's going to tax your great knowledge of international relations. And this comes from Alexander Brindle, who asks, what can we expect from the high level Hezbollah delegation to Russia later this month? Can Russia maintain relations with the GCC, with Iran and Israel simultaneously? So after bringing China into the formula, a little Russia-Iran here to bring the session to a close and then over to Stephanie. Uh, short answer, Eugene, is yes. This is the same Russia which fights the Turks in, 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 in Syria and then sits with the Turks and, and negotiates a final settlement for Syria. This is the same Russia which provides military support um, for Syria and sells S-400s to Turkey. Uh, this is the same Russia that arms Iran, but also sells weapons to UAE. Uh, so there is no contradiction as far as Russian policy is concerned. Um, it, it's very much uh, uh, no enemies. Who remembers that one where Erdogan uh, was talking about way back uh, in, the, in the old days uh, approach and, 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 and you know, a, a, a meeting with Hezbollah leadership is in many ways a good thing as far as I'm concerned, because it's actually dialogue if the Russians are serious about winding up the civil war in Syria. None of that, of course, addresses Syria's deep, deep crisis. And re-election of Assad as president is merely prolonging the pain. We've talked about, well, I've talked about Yemen. Let me 
finish Eugene on another cross that, excusing the pun, that we're all carrying. Who would have thought that six million Syrians would be refugees outside of their homeland? Who would have thought that nine million Syrians would be refugees in their own country? Syria, of all places, place of learned civilization, of culture, of multi-religious convergence, of, of literature, of science, would be reduced to a rubble as it is now, yeah? This Syria needs the support of all of us, but it should break all of our hearts to see a Syrian carrying a bucket for water across the Jordanian desert. It should break all of our hearts. This is not the Syria that we have known. Thank you very much, Anush. Just finally to thank Anush for what was an extremely informative, if rather depressing survey of the situation over the last few years. Um, I think the, 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 the questions have indicated how many issues have been raised and discussed. And I, and I think we have all found it extremely useful and enlightening. So once again, many thanks for taking the time and trouble to, to give this lecture. We're extremely grateful, and I think it's been it's been extremely useful. Thank you very much, Anush. Thank you, Stephanie. The pleasure has been all mine. Uh, I'm sorry I wasn't there in Oxford to enjoy your hospitality tonight, uh, but I will take a couple of rain checks for that. <laughs> and it's been an absolute honour to be able to give this year's annual lecture. Uh, all Thank the very you. best to you and, and your audience. Thank you very much. Thank you.